Hi, my name is Erica Carlson. I'm a theoretical physicist at the Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute. Welcome to Quantum Connections, where we have interesting conversations with people working on all things quantum. Our guest today is Dr. Una Kim, who's a professor at Cornell University. Dr. Kim has uh, won several awards in the field. She won some early career awards, for example, from uh, the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. She's a Simons Fellow in theoretical physics right now. She's going to be one of the keynote speakers at a summer school coming up on harnessing the quantum matter data revolution. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kim. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So one of the things we'd like to hear from you is why do you think that people are excited about all things quantum right now? So quantum mechanics have uh, existed since 1920s, um, but until recently, it although we know uh, it is an important principle that underlies a uh, visible world at a smaller scale, it was something that was very abstract and not tangible. We couldn't experience quantum mechanics of individual um, spins, electrons, because it's so small. Uh, it, Right uh, recently, the quantum computers became available to uh, public uh, for anybody to go and uh, have hands-on experiences through Google, IBM, and Amazon. And that totally changes the picture. Now, what used to be very abstract can be actually experienced um, in using these uh, computers that are available by, uh, on the cloud. And um, the questions that were sort of philosophical now become a very practical question, very tangible questions. So I think um, quantum and quantum engineering is in sort of a very early, uh, sort of like a, it just sprouted. Like it's kind of like, you know, you have this big seed that's very promising and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for it to sprout. And some said it will never sprout. Some said quantum will be forever technology of future, topic of future. But it has sprouted. Um, now we have this uh, early technology, early systems that are um, delicate, like a little sprout of a big plant. But you know, all biggest trees start from a tiny little seed and a very delicate, tiny little um, sprouts. Uh, but it can grow into a big tree. And we are a lucky generation to be witnessing this moment of that sprouting. And we have the opportunity to, to shape how this sprout is going to grow into a big plant, what it can do for us. So it's a very exciting time. Now I'm curious, and I think our audience is curious too, what originally got you interested in becoming a scientist? From when I was little, I was always interested in observing the world around me and trying to understand what's going on, right? Um, and it was that um, scientific principles, especially physics, uh, allows you to very economically understand many different things at many different scales uh, became really exciting to me. So Going back to when I was little, um, growing up in Korea, uh, when I was in elementary school, we didn't have air conditioning. So during the summer days, the way to keep us cool was to bring uh, ice cold water that we uh, put a water bottle in the uh, freezer the night before. And, you know, second grade was first time I got to do this myself. You know, first graders, mothers would do it. And now I put my bottle in the freezer. And the next morning I found that the bottle has swore, swollen. Like I, I filled it up to the brim and it had swollen. Mm -hmm. And I asked my dad, who was a professor of engineering, like, why is this happening? And he said, well, you know, water molecules form the hydrogen bond and the molecule is bent. And he was using all this jargon. And I complained to him that, you know, you should explain to me in the language that I can understand. If you really understood what's going on, you should be able to explain in a way that I can understand. So we had a big fight. Um, and I ended up being not satisfied because I didn't end up understanding exactly why this was happening, except that something's very special about water. Um, but what I did get out of that was that uh, the, the notion that the properties of materials that we can feel and experience 
are actually controlled by what's happening at a much smaller scale that's invisible. And even though the molecule themselves are not visible and hydrogen bonds are not visible, and these require some you know, jargons and advanced concepts, it is possible, if I study hard enough, to understand why this is happening. That, that was uh, sort of a, a hook that was interesting. There are other moments in my elementary school that were really important to me that left a sort of a strong memory impression in my mind. And one of, another one of them also has to do with temperature is the experience of magnetism. So uh, we, you, we had this experiment of rubbing bar magnet to nails, which you know many, many kids would have the experience of. So what happened, what was really fascinating happening in front of my eyes was that, you know, I have magnet, which has red and blue, obviously it's a mat bar magnet. And I have nails, which are not sticking to anything. I, I rub that nail to the magnet and all of a sudden these nails start sticking to each other. They are magnetized. So that was already really, really cool. But then it was a cold winter day when we were doing this experiment and we got to put these nails that are stuck together on our on top of our wood burning stove, which was a mechanism of heating. And in front of our eyes, these nails fell apart on top of wood burning stove. And I'm like, this is magical. Like something's happening here. First of all, rubbing the magnet to the, the nail made something happen to these nails. And that was undone when we heated up. And this was whole really fascinating thing that's happening in front of my eyes. And I and I got to understand it way back late, way, way, way later in college. That's when I decided I'm going to study condensed matter physics because condensed matter physics explains uh, what was always fascinating and um, curious to me. Another experience was of, of interference and in optics. Um, I, I, we, we had rainy seasons uh, in Korea and we have puddles of water always in the summers and always there is some some oil floating on top and there is rainbow color. Um, in high school physics, um, I got to understand that the same, there is a principle of interference underlying that rainbow, which is same as uh, the principle that allowed us to see rainbow in, uh, in my friend's hair. It's girls high school, everybody with straight short hair, and the hair strands can can actually work as what's called what we call diffraction grading, which allows this interference um, to show up and different uh, wavelengths uh, colors of uh, light to reveal itself. And just sitting down and being able to put all this together into a few equations was just really exhilarating. So these kind of experiences of connecting my everyday life to something that I can understand and remember is what um, what made me want to become a scientist so that I can forever learn. Very exciting, very exciting. Thanks for those stories. Um, of course, I I love all that physics too. So I'm, I'm you know you're telling me about these things and it's bringing back memories of me of you know the first time I saw this or the first time I saw that. It's I think curiosity is what drives a lot of us to be scientists. Now you have a lot of great research going on in your lab. Um, I know this because I'm Dr. Kim's colleague. She is a superstar in the field. So I know you've got more going on than you can tell us about. But could you tell us maybe about the thing you're most excited about right now in your research program at Cornell? What I'm really excited about right now is how I, we can use uh, classical computers and uh, classical machines uh, to help this sprout of quantum grow and become stronger. In other words, uh, the quantum systems right now are noisy and small, but um, as they become available, that's presenting us what kind of challenges we would have in helping this sprout to become a big tree that can serve humanity. And in um, addressing those challenges, um, we are finding a lot of opportunities of bringing the classical machines abilities to model, abilities to mine data that can help us understand what's going on in mysterious and secretive quantum systems. So this hybrid approach that can, uh, which I think of as a sort of a mechanism that can help us um, help us see this 
um, sprout grow into a tree. Uh, that's really an exciting uh, direction right now. And being able to get my hands on uh, the uh, latest current um, quantum systems data and using looking at them with machine learning tools is just really fun. A um, lot of open questions and always I'm trotting uh, the, the water that I don't know where where it is deep, how deep it gets. And it's just um, very, um, it's an exploration that's exhilarating. Well, Dr. Kim, that's all very fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for joining us on Quantum Connections. Thank you for having me.